So I'd like to uh, introduce uh, our newest associate in uh, <clears throat> Northern California Medical Associates Cardiology, Reza Seferdad, who <coughs> comes to us by way of UC Davis. Um, Reza got his MD at uh, New York Medical College and then came uh, west to Davis and has been there ever since doing uh, residency and then fellowship and then finally he uh, completed a fellowship in vascular medicine and peripheral arterial intervention so <clears throat> he's well trained and well schooled on the latest techniques uh, and both evaluation and therapy of peripheral vascular disease. So we're, we're very pleased to have uh, Reza as part of our interventional team, and I'm very pleased to introduce him this morning um, uh, as he is going to give a talk on uh, the aspects of peripheral arterial disease. Okay, well, thank you, Tom, and um, hope everybody is uh, doing okay so far. Um, so uh, for the next 30 minutes or so, 35 minutes or so, I'm going to um, discuss uh, PAD, peripheral arterial disease, with a... Um, with a focus on diagnosis and treatment. I have no disclosures, but I have a disclaimer. Uh, if anybody is a little squeamish or um, doesn't handle looking at foot ulcers or pictures of foot ulcers well, I just want to warn you, please, uh, if you're snacking on a muffin or a bagel from breakfast, please <laughs> start eating that now before we get to the latter half of the talk. But um, so as a background, uh, PAD uh, refers to occlusive atherosclerotic disease of the aorta, mesenteric, and the uh, lower extremities. I'm only going to be discussing the lower extremities today. Obviously, discussing um, atherosclerotic disease of the aorta and mesenteric, I'll take a couple of hours on its own. So the scope of the talk today is only going to focus on the lower extremities. And the classic symptom of PAD is intermittent claudication, and that's defined as pain, aching, and fatigue, or discomfort uh, in the lower extremities that is actually caused by exercise, and it's actually reproducible with exercise, and it's referred uh, as, as relieved with rest. So the incidence, um, it's around 3 to 10 percent of uh, people that are less than 70 um, years of age, and it actually increases to uh, 15 to 20 percent in uh, people that are older than 30 years of age. Um, what makes this rather difficult is that about 40 percent of these folks are uh, without any symptoms. So they have PAD, but they have no symptoms. So almost half these folks were seen in clinic, but they have no defined diagnosis. And only 10 of them do develop uh, or present with classic um, claudication. What makes this even more challenging is that um, when these people are actually diagnosed, about a third of them have already occluded a vessel to their legs by the time they're actually presenting with, with symptoms. So by that point, obviously, preventative measures are not going to be very effective. So in the U.S., this is actually data from 2005, uh, AHA data from 2005. Um, they approximated that close to 8 to 12 million of, uh, of people uh, in the U.S. did have PAD in various stages of form. And they extrapolate that by 2050, that's, that, that number is going to reach around 19 million. So it may actually surpass, potentially, the prevalence of uh, CAD. So pathophysiology, um, as we all know, this is driven by atherosclerosis. And this is, uh, in, in, the, in the vast majority of cases in people with PAD, it's, a, it's an atherosclerotic process. I mean, granted, we do see the occasional zebra, you know, different types of vasculitis, whether it's burgers, um, giant cell, FMD, uh, Takayasu's arthritis, those things do cause claudication PAD, but that's very, very rare. Usually it is atherosclerosis. And um, plaque develops uh, at branch points in arteries, and that's uh, usually in response to effects of disturbed blood flow uh, on endothelial cells. And that supports a, um, a response to injury hypothesis, uh, where hemodynamic uh, stress causes endothelial cell injury and vascular inflammation, and that kicks off the whole um, atherosclerotic process with plaque buildup. Uh, in addition, there is also impaired vasodilatation um, dilatation as well, and that's due to decreased uh, nitric oxide release from uh, the endothelium, and uh, that's further exagger exa exaggerated with vasoconstriction due to uh, release of localized tissue factors and different types of inflammatory factors that um, promotes further um, 
uh, vasoconstriction and, uh, and uh, occlusion. So the risk factors for PAD, uh, it's the same as uh, the risk factors for CAD as one would expect. Um, that this includes advanced age, smoking, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, uh, being of uh, African American or Hispanic ethnicity, CKD and dialysis, and being on dialysis, and obesity. So looking at the various independent risk factors for PAD, uh, in this uh, age-adjusted cohort um, from a study done by uh, Newman and colleagues published in Circulation, um, they looked at uh, 5,000 patients or so who had PAD. And of all the risk factors, diabetes had the highest relative risk. Uh, second to that was smoking, followed by hypertension and hypercholesteremia. And um, looking at the prevalence of PAD with increasing age, um, and I included two uh, large population-based studies here. This is the uh, Rotherham study results um, from the Netherlands in yellow. And then I also included the San Diego study, uh, just because you know, we think people in San Diego are pretty healthy, but I just want to show you that you know, eating fish tacos and surfing all day doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, spare you from PAD. So it's not preventative. Fish tacos do not prevent PAD. But uh, as you can see here, uh, early in life, um, in, the, in the fifth decade of life, the prevalence is around 10%. And once, once, once when, uh, we reach the seventh decade of life, that's doubled to around 20%, and it actually exponentially increases. So by the, the eighth decade of life, it's reached almost 60% of people uh, uh, who, have, you know, at, at, who are 80 and have PAD. So it's, it's prevalent, it's obviously prevalent. And again, uh, similarly, the San Diego group um, uh, study as well, much smaller cohort of 600 patients, but there was also a similar increase in the prevalence of PAD with increasing age. So what is the relationship between diabetes and PAD? We all know, you know, we all have treated patients with horrible diabetic foot ulcers. Uh, so what is the relationship here? Uh, we know that uh, diabetes accounts for almost 50 to 70 percent of all non-traumatic foot amputations in the U.S. Uh, these patients have uh, PAD that's more severe and it's actually more rapidly progressive. Furthermore, uh, what complicates things is that uh, neuropathy actually masks uh, symptoms of PAD. Therefore, these folks actually present later on in life. And not only does it involve the large vessels, it's more of a microvascular disease. Um, so these folks end up um, presenting in much later stages. And what's interesting is that uh, women actually have, um, uh, diabetic women have, uh, for, 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 men, diabe for women, diabetes is actually a, uh, is a stronger risk factor for developing PAD than for men. So I just want to impress upon you that uh, the risks for PAD are actually synergistic. So if you would look at this graph here um, on, the, uh, on the right side, this is folks who have um, hypertension, uh, high cholesterol, and impaired glucose tolerance. Just the presence of smoking alone almost nearly uh, more than doubles their, um, their risks, um, or actually their, the, the risks for PAD. So again, this is a synergistic effect. In terms of um, uh, prevalence of PAD in age and uh, at risk patients who are not symptomatic, so these are just people that are in our clinics here walking around who have no symptoms. What is their prevalence? The PARTNER trial actually looked at around, the PARTNER's um, program was, a, again, a population-based study, 7,000 7, patients who were asymptomatic uh, just come into the, you know, to our clinics here, primary care doc clinics, and they received screening ABIs. Uh, the criteria that they used uh, in terms of who they screened was people who were 70 years of age without symptoms and people that were between 50 and 69 years of age um, who, um, who had a history of smoking or diabetes. So these are folks, again, that we saw based on um, the increased prevalence of PAD with age and also uh, with the two main risk factors for PAD um, who they screened, again, without symptoms. And surprisingly, almost 30% of these patients had, had PAD that was not diagnosed. So again, a large, major, a, a large majority of these patients are walking around um, without any symptoms who have PAD. So if they're at risk, 30% of these patients do have underlying disease. So how come, I'm, how come I'm telling you all this? Why is this all important? Because again, PAD actually kills people. It doesn't kill people primarily from PAD, but it puts them at risk for increased cardiovascular mortality. And if you would look here, um, 
there's a two to three fold increase um, death rate in patients with PAD from stroke, four, four fold increase in death from a fatal MI or cardiac related death um, uh, in patients with PAD, and all in all, cardiovascular uh, related mortality increases to six fold in these patients. So again, very robust uh, increase in mortality in these people. And more interestingly, these folks don't die, ju don't die just, don't just die from cardiovascular related death, they die more, period, for, for any reason. So they're all cause mortality increases as well. And I'm gonna go over ABIs in a second, but uh, just to um, uh, discuss this graph here. So normal ABI is around one. Uh, and as you can see here, in white, this is all cause mortality. And um, as the ABI, which is a marker for uh, uh, impaired perfusion, as the ABI drops, uh, and so therefore more severe PAD, all cause mortality goes up, just as we saw with cardiovascular mortality. And uh, in folks who have higher ABIs, and we'll get to this in a sec, this actually signifies that these vessels are calcified and they're not compressible. Therefore, the ABI is falsely elevated. These people have PAD. And similarly, their all-cause mortality is increased, so is their cardiovascular um, mortality as well. So again, they, they die from cardiovascular-related death, and they actually die because of increased mortality all in all. Um, just to review this once again, so the, the relative risk of death from all causes is uh, three times greater in patients with PAD compared to the general population. And uh, diabetes is actually, so PAD is actually an independent uh, risk factor for cardiovascular mortality. And this is independent of age, BMI, smoking, cholesterol, blood pressure, fasting, glucose, um, angina, MI, or stroke. So how do these patients present? What is the uh, spectrum of manifestations for PAD? Um, and again, it is pretty, pretty, uh, pretty wide. Uh, they could be without any symptoms. They could have intermittent clotic Claudication, they could have CLI, and CLI uh, patients have rest pain, they have ulcerations, uh, they have necrosis or gangrene as seen here. This is um, some ulcerations here and uh, gangrene in various stages. Furthermore, um, they could actually come in with acute, acute limb ischemia. And in terms of claudication, the site of the blockage or obstruction actually localizes uh, and uh, we could determine where uh, actually, it localizes and also, uh, also determines where the patient is going to actually have symptoms. So if the obstruction is in the aorta or the iliac artery, the patient will present with ischemia or claudication um, in the buttocks, hip, or the thigh. If the um, obstruction or uh, stenosis is in the uh, femoral artery, they usually have thigh pain or calf pain. If it's down, uh, involving the, uh, the popliteal vessels or below, these folks will have calf pain, ankle pain, or foot pain. So what makes this more difficult, or rather challenging, is sometimes it's hard to, to tease out if this is truly, or if their claudication or their pain. Is it PAD or is it something else? Is it musculoskeletal? Is it spinal stenosis? Uh, how do we tell? So in, uh, usually, claudication from ischemic sources uh, happens in muscle groups, not in joints. So if a joint is involved, more than likely the pain uh, is not secondary to a vascular abnormality or claudication. Um, secondly, uh, pain relief from claudication with rest uh, is independent of position, uh, usually, and it completely resolves. It will go away once the patient rests. And, and the, uh, the, uh, the recovery or uh, relief from pain usually happens within five minutes of resting. So just to put this in, uh, in a graph here or, or a table, and I'm sorry, I don't think the, the bottom portion of this turned out so well, but um, we could tell, um, or we could differentiate between pseudoclaudication from different types of musculoskeletal related pain versus claudication by looking at the characteristics of the discomfort, the location of discomfort, if it's exercise induced, the, the, the distance that they could walk before symptoms starts, uh, whether it's positional, standing, or, um, or uh, whether it's alleviated or exacerbated with standing, and then time to relief. So in terms of the characteristics of the pain, again, claudication usually is reported as cramping, tightness, or aching and fatigue. Patients with pseudoclaudication will have similar symptoms. However, they may report some tingling, numbness, burning, and that goes towards more of a neuropathic type pain. Um, 
uh, again, the location of discomfort doesn't really help us determine uh, from one versus the other. Uh, is it exercise induced? Again, that doesn't really help us either. Uh, uh, but the distance in terms of a claudicant type pain is usually consistent. They will tell you, I'm walking a half, in half a block and I get pain, and it's reproducible. Whereas if it's a non-vascular um, related pain or if it's, if it's, if it's pseudoclaudication, um, their distance before their symptoms start, it is, it is variable to an extent. In terms of um, positional relief from pain, if you can imagine if somebody has a blocked artery, if they stand up, it's going to improve perfusion. So these folks, when they stand up or if they dangle their legs uh, down the side of the bed, the pain actually improves. So that's a key thing to look for in terms of teasing out uh, one versus the other. Uh, usually pain that's not um, due to a vascular insufficiency um, uh, it gets worse uh, from standing. If it's back pain, if it's hip pain, if it's spinal stenosis, these folks uh, have more discomfort when they actually stand. And then lastly, time to relief. Um, claudication pain goes away pretty immediately, whereas pain that's due to a musculoskeletal ideology takes time for it to resolve, up to 30 minutes. So other, um, physical, um, other, other clinical features and physical fi exam findings that we should look at, again, obviously the hallmark for uh, diagnosing PAD is uh, absence or a weak pulse. So the physical exam is paramount in terms of making a diagnosis here. Um, and again, a decreased or absent pulse will tell us exactly uh, or help localize where the obstruction is. Um, usually, if the, if the pulse is weak, um, let's say in the popliteal, then that may imply that the, the, obviously the, um, the area of stenosis is proximal to the palpated artery. And then a brewery, obviously. So um, that implies um, accelerated flow uh, through a disturbance, and you would hear a brewery. So, um, uh, basically, that's something that should be looked at in, uh, on exam. So, pulse examination and breweries are, um, are paramount in terms of helping us uh, diagnose PAD uh, in patients. Other findings, um, this again involves uh, uh, changes in the skin and the, uh, the, the, nail, the nails and muscle uh, due to a lack of blood flow. So, you may see thinning of the skin, you could have smooth, shiny appearance of the skin, uh, there could be some subcutaneous uh, fat atrophy. Uh, loss of hair is very common. Um, the nails could be thickened and hypertrophic. Uh, you, could ha you could have some, you could actually induce pallor uh, by elevating the leg above the heart. So if the patient's lying supine, you lift her leg up, um, you will see pallor um, of the foot and the, and the calves if there is, um, if there is a, um, a lesion or obstruction there, more proximally. Muscle atrophy in the later stages, and then ulcerations um, uh, are, are, um, could be seen in later stages. So just to kind of review what types of ulcerations we see in, um, in vascular um, insufficiency, uh, these ulcers are usually um, uh, well uh, circumscribed. They um, have a pale, pale base initially, um, and they are localized usually in areas that uh, receive uh, the most amount of trauma or injury. This involves you know, uh, the, the tips of the toes from tight-fitting shoes or the heels of the, uh, of the foot. Uh, and again, these are representative um, pictures of what one may see, um, obviously, in later stages of, of this disease entity. So we classify um, uh, PAD based on clinical presentation using the Rutherford's classification. This helps pretty much convey to your, uh, you know, uh, with, um, uh, how severe um, their level of PAD is. Stage zero is uh, without any symptoms. Stage one uh, or, cl or class one uh, patients have mild claudication. Class two patients have moderate claudication. And this is lifestyle limiting. And with claudication, um, symptoms uh, becoming noticeable um, after walking 200 meters. So the patient could actually go above 200 meters and, uh, or stage or class three if there is severe claudication before reaching 200 meters, um, rest pain, minor ischemia um, or ulcerations, uh, and um, severe ischemic ulcerations. So stage four, five, and six, that puts us in CLI range. And what is CLI? Uh, CLI is defined as ischemia causing rest pain, which can often result in a non-healing ulcer, which could ultimately lead to a limb loss if the, the vessel isn't revascularized somehow. 
And I want to impress upon you that uh, um, the progression, the cumulative 10-year progression of patients who have intermittent claudication to CLI is 30%, and this is despite treatment. And 12% uh, of these patients with CLI will have a major amputation within three months. Uh, and 20% of these patients die within a year. So again, it is imperative to not let this get to, to the point where you have, you have ulcerations or rest pain or ischemia. So CLI, you know, obviously at that point, things are pretty, pretty serious. Uh, what is acute limb ischemia? Again, I just have to include this in our talk here just to make sure that we cover the entire spectrum. Uh, but it's a vascular emergency from acute occlusive, occlusive event, and this is typically caused by thrombosis um, rather, than, rather than embolus. But again, we do see emboli, embolic events from AFib, so on and so forth, causing acute limb ischemia. And um, at this point, the patient has, could develop permanent uh, neuromuscular damage, and, uh, and uh, if, it's, if it's not dealt with immediately, uh, obviously death could ensue, um, or the, the limb has to be removed. Um, now, the clinical features of acute limb ischemia, I'm sure you've all heard this, but uh, includes the six Ps, which involve pain, pallor, paresthesias, paralysis, pulselessness, and polyclothermia, which is the inability to regulate temperature. If we have hit paresthesias or paralysis, that uh, represents irreversible damage. So, diagnostic modalities. How do we screen for these patients and how to be diagnosed. So ABIs is the, uh, is, is the, is the most widely used examination. Um, segmental limb pressures, pulse volume recordings, Doppler velocity waveform analysis, um, treadmill exercise testing, um, duplex scanning, um, C uh, more advanced imaging techniques including CT and MRI. I'm gonna highlight most of these um, in the next few slides. So. ABI uh, index, um, the ACC uh, states that it should be performed for all patients with suspected lower extremity PAD, and they define them as people who are 70 years of age with exertional leg symptoms or non-healing wound, or if they're 50 years of age with these symptoms and a history of smoking or diabetes. The ADA is a, is a bit more aggressive. They suggest that um, patients with diabetes be um, screened um, uh, with an ABI who are younger than 50 years of age who have other risk factors for PAD, okay? In terms of um, how does one do an ABI and what are we looking at when we do this, um, basically the pressure is taken from the ankle either at the PT or the dorsalis pedis and the highest pressure that's obtained is divided by the highest pressure taken from each arm. Uh, and uh, an ABI less than 0.9 is actually abnormal uh, and it's 95% sensitive for angiographically confirmed uh, peripheral arterial disease. So it's a very sensitive study. Just to review once again, uh, 0.8 to 0.9 indicates mild obstruction, 0.4 to 0.8 moderate obstruction, less than 0.4 it is severe obstruction. And as I mentioned before, if the ABIs are elevated, uh, that does imply that the vessel is non-compressible, it's calcified, and these patients are actually, um, they, do, they do have peripheral vascular disease or peripheral arterial disease. So in terms of uh, uh, segmental limb pressure and pulse uh, volume recordings, um, these, these can be very helpful in terms of localizing where the area of stenosis may be. Um, this is a normal waveform on the right. This is, this is a triphasic waveform is what we call it. And um, there is uh, a brisk upstroke, brisk downstroke, and a dichrotic notch. And you don't see any major pressure, um, uh, pressure, pressure drop off as you go from the different, um, different levels of the lower extremity. Whereas in this case, this is, this is a monophasic waveform in the upper thigh, indicating that more than likely there is a, a stenosis further up. And then as you could imagine, uh, see here, there's actually a pressure drop off going from the, um, the upper thigh to the, to the lower thigh. Uh, more than 20 millimeters of mercury pressure drop off indicates a potential stenosis. And uh, more than likely this patient had a stenosis in their um, SFA as well. Um, other uh, diagnostic studies that could be used, um, which could also help um, in terms of diagnosis, is uh, a post-exercise ABI. And what we're doing here is, um, having the patient uh, um, exercise and we'll check ABIs right after exercise and see how they uh, recover over time uh, 
uh, once exercise has, um, has, has been stopped. So in some cases, uh, especially if there is proximal disease or in calcified vessels where the ABIs may not be reliable um, and you have a high degree of suspicion for PAD, um, this could be done. Normally, again, uh, there's a mild decrease uh, in the ABI in healthy patients. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and usually, the ABI recovers pretty, pretty quickly in normal patients. Uh, in case of even moderate occlusive disease, usually in the proximal vessels, the ABI decreases substantially, as seen here, 0.37 and 0.57, and uh, the recovery is actually blunted. And uh, this could imply that there is, there is a lesion there. Um, again, either that, that wasn't picked up either on um, standard ABI due to calcification, or it's a proximal aorta occlusive stenosis that we can uh, quite pick up on. So this could be very helpful in terms of teasing out folks who have PAD with, uh, with the relatively normal or indeterminate uh, ABIs. Uh, so a quick little um, um, uh, flow, flow chart here in terms of how to go about potentially uh, diagnosing these folks. Um, again, obviously history and physical is paramount. Uh, if there's any um, suggestion of claudication or physical exam findings that may imply um, occlusive disease or insufficiency, arresting ABI should be ordered. If it's abnormal, then fantastic. You've established your diagnosis. At that point, we have to assess severity and um, initiate therapy. If it's, no, if it's normal or indeterminate and you still have a high suspicion for, for disease, at this point you would move on to, a, to, to another non-invasive study, either a pulse wave, a pulse volume recording, Doppler waveform analysis, or a duplex. If that's abnormal, great, you've diagnosed a patient with PAD. Um, if not, you would put them on a treadmill and try to tease out any underlying PAD that's not coming up. Okay? Uh, and then going to um, uh, advanced vascular imaging modalities, MRI angiography and CT angiography could both be used. Both have their pros and cons here. Uh, in my opinion, um, really this should be reserved uh, in determining the anatomy and the side of the blockage. So once the diagnosis is confirmed, um, one should proceed with an angiogram. And this really helps uh, the interventionalist or the vascular surgeon determine their candidacy for intervention and how to actually approach, approach um, revascularization. And uh, for the most part, uh, again, this is my personal uh, opinion that um, CT angio is probably the best modality, it's faster, and um, you, you actually get an angiographic-like representation of what you would see in the cath lab, so um, it is probably the most useful uh, in, some, in terms of comparing it to what we see in the cath lab. So very quickly, once again, this is the ACC AHA uh, practice cloud lines for diagnosing PAD. Um, so if the patient is asymptomatic, we proceed with an ABI. If they have symptoms, ABI or, or a duplex should be ordered. If uh, you want to tease out or rule out um, ABI versus pseudoclaudication, uh, ABI with exercise could be potentially helpful. Um, and if you're looking at uh, if the patient is going to be um, a candidate for revascularization or, or what strategy of revascularization should be used, a duplex or a CT MRI could help um, uh, confirm a diagnosis and also um, show the anatomy um, much more clearly. And then obviously when it's time for intervention, an angiogram will be done. So treatment. Um, the hallmark or the cornerstone is aggressive risk factor modification in these patients. Uh, smoking is the biggest thing. Um, it's, it's the most cost-effective measure available. And uh, just to hammer this home, uh, the rate of progression and amputation in patients who in, in PAD who, who keep smoking is actually two-fold higher than folks who quit smoking. And aspirin and Plavix should be used. Uh, these are uh, both helpful in treatment of PAD, but more importantly, they're, um, uh, they're helpful in reducing risk of MI, stroke, vascular uh, death in patients, patients with after, uh, in PAD, who are actually at risk for higher uh, cardiovascular mortality. And obviously blood pressure control and diabetes control is, uh, is, uh, is important. Um, I just put this slide in here just to um, discuss statin use in these folks. Um, you know, statins have not been proven to have any uh, benefit in terms of uh, claudication relief. Um, you know, people who have after, uh, PAD are at, you know, obviously at risk for CAD, so they're going to be on a statin regardless. But did it help in terms of reducing claudication? 
the studies are, um, you know, they have not really quite uh, teased out a real, um, real significant uh, claudication reduction. But uh, this one study here, looking at um, doses of 10 and 80 milligrams of uh, atrovastatin, there was some increased, uh, there was some benefit, but it wasn't uh, significant, unfortunately. Uh, but there was some trend towards benefit in terms of uh, um, pain-free walking time in, in claudicans. So um, uh, therapy is based on symptoms. If the patient has intermittent, intermittent claudication, exercise therapy is effective. And we'll talk about salazazol in a second. That's the only, that's one of the, that's, that's the only FDA-approved medication that's effective. Uh, and obviously, if both of those fail, you would move on to revascularization. The goal in patients with claudication is to provide relief of symptoms. In CLI, um, wound care, antibiotics, if, if, if there is superinfection, and obviously revascularization should be uh, employed. And again, the goal here is to improve survival in these patients and limb salvage. So again, going back to salazazol, it is the only FDA-approved medication that helps reduce claudication. Uh, it's a phosphodiesterase type 3 inhibitor. It has um, vasodilator and antiplatelet effects. Uh, the dose that's affected is 100 milligrams, that's recommended is 100 milligrams POBID. Common side effects include GI symptom um, uh, uh, um, issues such as nausea, diarrhea, GI upset, headaches and palpitations may be common. And in patients who have CHF, this is contraindicated because uh, it's been shown to actually decrease survival in patients with, uh, with any form of heart failure. Uh, this is a um, uh, chart demonstrating the uh, results of uh, meta-analyses of four randomized placebo-controlled trials. And as you can see here, uh, pledial or salazazole at a dose of 200 milligrams uh, per day was, was extremely effective in um, uh, in um, increasing um, uh, the, the maximal walking distance in these, in these patients. So it's a very effective drug if it's tolerated. What about exercise? You know, um, your patients are coming into you saying, look, my, my legs hurt, I can't walk, and you're going to tell them, go walk. I mean, they'll tell you you're crazy. It's like, what are you trying to do to me? But really, it really, really, truly helps, okay? Um, and as seen here, uh, this Bar graph, uh, bar graph shows the results of, um, again, meta-analysis of 21 studies. And um, they, uh, so they assess the benefits of exercise training in patients with claudication and the mean distance to onset of claudication pain, uh, as seen in, uh, in white, um, increased by 179%. Uh, similarly, the distance to maximal claudication pain also increased. So it's extremely effective it could be if, if, if it could be employed and done. Uh, but not all types of exercise are effective. Um, there's actually a proven regimen in terms of what provides the most effect in these patients. Um, duration of exercise has to be more than 30 minutes per session. They have to exercise for more than three times a week. Um, the, uh, the program length, um, they have to uh, be enrolled in a program or do this for more than 26 weeks to see effects. So, so the effects are delayed and, and, um, and it takes time to actually see some benefits. And they have to actually push themselves to near maximal pain. So this is sometimes very challenging. But unless they're actually pushing themselves to the point where uh, they're, uh, they're developing pain, they won't uh, um, see much of a benefit. And, and it is walking, and not, and not a whole lot more. It is walking that, require, that provides the, the highest benefit in these patients. Now going to revascularization. Um, so in terms of aortoiliac um, disease, um, Obviously, bypass surgery is an option. Um, the primary patency at five years in patients who underwent surgical uh, revascularization was between 81 to, 50, uh, 81 to 85 percent. Um, and these patients had a pretty high uh, percentage of, um, of perioperative mortality. This is vascular surgery. Vascular surgery is one of the highest, it is the highest risk surgery that we put our patients through. So they have a high um, perioperative mortality. And it's usually, uh, in the cases of aortoiliac disease, it's reserved for severe, severe diffuse uh, cases. And it's indicated for patients with Rutherford class three and beyond symptom knowledge. So this is in patients who have lifestyle limiting claudication. In terms of percutaneous intervention, uh, the primary patency rate at five years is around 75 to 80%, fairly comparable. Um, and again, the mortality in these cases is almost negligible, it's nil. 
And it is a treatment of choice in these patients if it could be done um, from, a, from an anatomical uh, uh, perspective. If it's feasible, it should be done. Uh, and it's indicated for patients uh, who have Rutherford class 2 and above symptoms. So again, uh, people that have lifestyle limiting claudication. So a couple of cases here. Um, this is a patient that was 76 uh, years old, di diabetic and t uh, smoking as one would expect. Uh, they had right thigh pain and calf claudication, which had worsened for about six months. We put them on, uh, we got an ABI on, on them, and uh, it was abnormal in both lower extremities, but, but markedly abnormal in the right lower extremity. Um, they tried salostazole, which was initially helpful, but, um, uh, but they continued to have symptoms despite that. And again, they attempted a walking therapy protocol as well, but um, despite uh, 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 attempts at walking therapy, uh, their symptoms were not controlled. So we referred them uh, for an angiogram, and uh, as you can see here, uh, this is, there's a, there's a, um, uh, a pretty uh, high-grade stenosis involved in the external iliac artery. Thankfully, this was able to be treated with a series of stents that was deployed with excellent angiographic results. The patient did very well, um, uh, ambulatory without any major claudication symptoms at the current time, so very, very effective. Uh, what about for um, disease involving the, uh, the femoral and the popliteal arteries. Again, bypass surgery or revascularization strategies with surgery are an option. Uh, the primary patency at five years is shown to be around 60 to 80 percent. Uh, vein grafts are preferred in terms of uh, compared to synthetic grafts for numerous reasons, but one is um, less chance for thrombosis of the graft. Uh, perioperative mortality is again there. This is vascular surgery, so there's about up to a three percent chance of uh, death perioperatively. And these patients um, should be, uh, should undergo surgery if they have Rutherford uh, class three symptoms and above. Uh, in terms of um, endovascular intervention in these folks, uh, patency is at uh, between, two, uh, patency at two to five years is between 50 to 70 percent. Uh, some technical problems could arise in terms of um, uh, chronic occlusions, the, the area of the stenosis, if it's in the common femoral or the popliteal, not the best place to actually try to put a stent in those sites. If, the, if there's diffuse disease, you can't line the whole thing up with stents, you know, uh, because that increases the risk for instant restenosis. Uh, the ductal canal could uh, play some, uh, could cause some difficulty, and if there's poor disease in the runoff vessels, you may not get a good result ultimately. So all these things may hinder um, the, um, uh, the, uh, the endovascular approach. And again, as one would expect, the uh, operative, the perioperative mortality in these cases is extremely, extremely low. And again, it's, this is reserved for people who have Rutherford class two and beyond symptoms. Another case, uh, this is a gentleman with um, diabetes, tobacco use, uh, ischemic breast pain, uh, and shown to have gangrene of his second digit and some involvement of the uh, third and fourth digit as well, or the fourth and fifth digit as well. So our ABIs, as one would expect, were uh, horrendously uh, low. Uh, le on the left side, it was 0.33, so again, this is CLI. Uh, he had a duplex ultrasound that demonstrated severe occlusion or uh, stenosis of the distal SFA. He had single vessel runoff. Uh, he went for an angiogram, and uh, this um, showed, a, a, again, a chronically totally occluded um, distal SFA with a reconstitution back on the popliteal artery. And this was stented, um, and we got a great result. Um, at this point, the patient, um, unfortunately, we couldn't salvage, salvage the toe, but uh, the, um, the gangrenous toe, they had to be amputated, but the, the fourth and, uh, digit and the fifth digit actually did recover, and he's ambulatory and making a pretty uh, decent recovery at this point. So general principles for revascularization. Um, claudicans should be revascularized only after a trial of exercise and pharmacotherapy is first, first, um, first used. Um, inflow and outflow uh, should, be all, should be always be assessed for revascularization. You don't want to be stenting an SFA lesion or putting a patient through something um, in terms of revascularization strategy that involves the SFA when they may have an iliac uh, narrowing. So it has to be looked at before anything is done. Um, and if there is, um, uh, if, uh, if, if there is an inflow um, uh, stenosis, that should, be, uh, that, that should be addressed first before um, we uh, stent anything more or, uh, or do anything with a more distal, um, distal vessel. Um, and again, um, uh, revascularization in CLI um, uh, really aims to 
uh, provide straight line flow to the foot. That's our main objective in terms of helping salvage that limb. So in summary, um, PAD is very common. It has a significant impact upon uh, cardiovascular outcomes. The, uh, the treatment, even if they're asymptomatic, should involve risk factor modification and risk reduction. And uh, in patients with uh, intermittent claudication, exercise therapy, drug therapy, and selective use of revascularization is what's recommended. And for CLI, um, obviously more aggressive efforts at revascularization, possibly surgery, to reduce the risk of amputation should be done. And thank you. Do you have questions for Dr. Seferdad? Sure. Is there any um, progress in reimbursement for ABI? You know, I'm not sure, to be honest with you. Um, you know, um, I haven't really looked into that, looked into that much. Uh, what are you asking uh, in terms of um, insurance reimbursements and is there, is there any change? I'm not sh I don't think there is, as far as I know. That's, that's, that's a question to ask maybe Adam. If Adam's here, our uh, practice manager, he may, he may be able to answer that question. I'm not sure. I don't know. Hi. Um, you talked about statins not improving claudication. Mm -hmm. Are there any studies that look at other outcomes like uh, decreased rates of amputation or, you know, critical limb, limb ischemia? None that I've seen. None that I've seen. Okay. Um, really, the goal would be overall risk factor reduction. Okay. And as you saw um, earlier, uh, the relative risk for um, you know, for, with hypercholesteremia is, is, is relatively less uh, in terms of, um, uh, you know, causing PAD. You know, so um, as far as I know, there's not any major clinical trials that have looked at that specifically. Okay. Yes. Uh, can you pass and you about your approach there? Uh, meaning uh, 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 contrast-induced yeah. nephropathy? Well, it's like any other, um, you know, um, even if, if you're going for a coronary angiogram, you know, there's a risk, you know, um, that involves being very judicious with contrast use. Uh, you know, we have done cases with IVIS guided only, uh, so you could actually uh, minimize your contrast use once you maybe take one or two pictures uh, and then proceed with uh, strategies in the cath lab that would minimize contrast use if it's um, doing different types of um, uh, what we call, um, uh, um, you, could just use, you could use ultrasound if you wanted to, to actually be able to see um, what a lesion is and guide, use that, or you could use less contrast and take less pictures, obviously. So all these things would help. But again, much like any other uh, intervention, you're looking at trying to minimize contrast use. And we do that pretty much in all cases. But you're absolutely right, the risk is there. But we could minimize those risks beforehand as well. Uh, having adequate hydration, um, if they're anemic, you want to make sure that they're not anemic before they come in. So all these things have to be fleshed out. So there's a risk, absolutely. 